Okay, first, I should give you a warning. Buckle up, listen carefully, because we want to introduce a topic which is possibly the most difficult topic in the first quarter of mechanics of materials. We call it indeterminate axially loaded element. Um, let's consider this problem. It looks very easy. Two elements are fixed at two ends and they are subjected to one force at the middle. We want to determine how much is stress in element number one. How we can solve that? We simply say 90 kN divided by area of element number one and get stress. Is that correct? No, because that 90 kN is not all transferred by element number one. Part of that 90 kN is transferred by element number two. But how much is the share of each element? Do we know that? We need to determine the internal forces using free body diagram. So let's do that. I'm going to cut structure from two points like this, put on non forces here, and try to determine how much is internal force, F1 and F2. Let's write down the equilibrium equation, which is sum of the forces in x direction equal to 0. Start from left negative F1 plus 2 times 45 plus F2 is 0. How many unknowns we have? How many equations do we have here? Can we solve it? That's why we call it indeterminate, because we cannot determine internal forces using equilibrium equations. Okay? We need to get one extra equation at least to determine that internal difference internal force in each element. All right, let me talk about one example numerically. An aluminum alloy with a modular plasticity of 10,000 KSI with a cross-sectional area of 4.5 squared inch is connected at flange B to a steel pipe. Steel has a modular plasticity of 30,000 KSI with a cross-sectional area of 3.2 uh, squared inch. This assembly is connected to a rigid supports at A and C. For the loading shown, determine A, the normal stress in the aluminum pipe and steel pipe, B, the deflection of flange B. So, as I said, the problem that we have, the difficulty of this question is, we can't determine the internal forces using equilibrium equations. All right? Let me solve this problem step by step. As we discussed, we start from free body diagram. So we show the free body here. And step number one, we write down the equilibrium equation. Negative F1 plus 90 plus F2 is 0. And that gives me F2, F1 minus F2 equal to 90. And as we discussed, we can't determine this, these two announced by one equation. In step number two, I try to determine internal deflections in the system. Internal deflection in element number one is calculated from this equation. Delta one is FL over EA. All right, let's plug the values. F1 is unknown. I'm, I'm looking for that. I just write F1. How much is length of element number one? 160 inch. The modular plasticity of element number one is 10,000 KSI, and the area is 4.5 squared inch. Okay? So let me do the calculation and simplify that. That gives me F1 divided by 281.25. So I, I got the deformation in element number one as a function of internal force in that element. Let's do the same for element number two. In element number two, we use the same equation, FL over EA, but we use the parameters of that element, which, is, which are F2 times length, which is 220 inch, modular plasticity is 30,000 KSI, and area is 3.2. And then I will simplify that into this equation. Uh, number F2 divided by 436.36. All right? 
So we have calculated deformation in each element one by one. Now listen very carefully. This is the critical step. Is there any relation between delta 1 and delta 2 in this structure? How much is the total change in the length of this assembly? Zero. Which means that they are opposite to each other. Delta 1 plus delta 2 should be equal to zero. So that is the heart of this problem, the main part of this problem. So delta 1 plus delta 2 is 0. Let me plug the values that I got in step number 2. Delta 1 is F1 divided by 281.25. Delta 2 is F2 divided by 436.36. And that is equal to 0. Okay? Now, I will simplify this equation, which gives me F1 equal to negative 281.25 divided by 436.36 times F2, or F1 is negative 0.6445 F2. This is the second equation that relates F1 and F2 together. Now, how many equations do we have with respect to F1 and F2? We have two unknowns. Two equations, and we can solve them for force. This is what we do in the fourth step. What's your question, can sir? Can you explain again why delta 1 and delta 2 equals 0? Okay, can you step over here? Okay, I'm element number 1. Okay, you are element number 2. That is a fixed support, and that's another fixed support, okay? Take my hand and another hand, put your other hand on that fixed support. We can't move that support to the right and the support to the left. But there would be a change in me. Like, consider there is external force which pushes me in this way, so I shrink like that. Okay? And he is stretching. How much would be the total distance of that support to this support? Do you see any change? No. Even though we are moving here, okay, there are internal deflections, okay? So how much was my uh, shortening? That is equal to his extension, but opposite sign, because I, I'm getting shorter and he's getting longer. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So these two are equal to each other, but opposite sign. Good question. All right, now let's do the last step, which is determining, which solving these two equations. Step number four, we combine equation number one and two, and we get these two numbers. F1 is 37.25 keps, and F2 is negative 54.73 keps. Okay, let me give you tricks on how to check these numbers. The force that we got here is positive, F1. And look at the direction of the external force. It goes to the right. So element on the left should be under tension. So the, car the sign is, looks correct here. Okay? And the other force is under compression, so it gets negative sign. So the sign should be okay. Is there any way that I can check the magnitude of these two absorbed by the right element? Why the right element gets more force. Why it gets higher portion? Because it is more rigid. Look at the modular elasticity of that element. So E is three times larger. The area is smaller, but the product of EA is larger in element number two compared to element number one. So the force in that element should be larger than the force in element number one. This is how we can check and validate our calculation. All right? As an engineer, you should have a vision on what should be the answer of a problem. Because if you get a number, which is 0. 0.0037, and you think that all the calculations are correct, there should be something wrong there. This is how you can judge the answers and see if it, the answers looks correct or not. And this is something that you can gain by experience, by solving problems, designing different sections. 
All right, let's do the easy part, which is determining stress and deflection. Determining stress is force over area in element number one. I need to divide F1 by A1. Force in element number one is 35.27 kips, and area is 4.5 squared inch, and that gives me 7.84 KSI. And because it has positive sign, it is under tension. In element number two, we get sigma two equal to F2 divided by A2. F2 is negative 54.73 kips, and A2 is 3.2 squared inch. And that gives me negative 17.1 KSI. And negative sign here, it means that the element has compressive stress. And last step, this is the answer of part A. For part B, we need to determine how much is deflection or movement of this flange. Okay, what connects flange B to point A? Element number one. So how much would be the movement of flange? That would be the change in the length of element number one. And that's actually equal to the change in the element of length of element number two. So I can go for either way. All right, so delta one is uh, F1 divided by 281.25. I plug F1, and that gives me 0.125 inch. That is the change in the length of the element. That would be extension. It has positive sign. So the movement of flange B would be equal to delta 1, and that is 0.125 inch. And that point moves to the right, because it follows the direction of the applied force. And that's the answer of part B. Questions? All right. Now I would like to extend this to different kind of problems. All fit within the category of indeterminate axially loaded members. Um, we have learned that the compatibility condition for this problem is delta 1 plus delta 2. The compatibility condition is the main part of answering indeterminate problems. Okay? What would be the compatibility condition for this case? What is delta 1 and delta what is the relation between delta 1 and delta 2? Same. What about this one? What would be the relation between delta 1 and delta 2 in the bottom case? Can I say that delta 1 plus delta 2 is 0? Yeah. So they need to touch each other before getting to the element like the top one. So I can say that delta 1 plus delta 2 is equal to that gap. Okay? So these belong to the category, which I call it category number 1. So delta 1 plus delta 2 is 0, or delta 1 plus delta 2 is equal to a gap. Now, you tell me what is the compatibility condition in this case. What is the relation between deformation of the inner element and deformation of the outer element? Are they opposite to each other as we had before? They are equal to each other, because one is within the other one. All right. So I will write down delta 1 is equal to delta 2. What about these cases? In all these figures, delta 1 is equal to delta 2 because they are fully connected together. Or if there is a gap, as we see here, we need to consider the gap. In this case, we need to add the gap to the side which has less change in the length. I will solve problems to make sure we understand the concept. So the gap might be added to the left side or to the right side here. This is what we call it category number two. Okay, so one element within the other element. And here, how can I find the relation between delta one and delta two if the beam ABCD is rigid? Similar triangles. So in this case, delta one divided by AB or A, which is 36 inch, is equal to delta 2 divided by the length from A to C, which is shown by B here. And in this case, is 84 inch. OK? What about, say, this case? For this case, again, I will use similar triangles. Delta 1 
divided by 950 millimeter is equal to delta 2 divided by 425 millimeter. So in all these cases, we use similar triangle principle to establish a relation between delta 1 and delta 2. So in total, we have three categories. Let me finalize the steps that we need to take to answer and determinate axially loaded elements. In the first step, we will use a free body diagram to determine internal forces. Use equilibrium equation which in total are some of the forces in x direction, y direction, and some of the moments should be zero. If the number of equations are sufficient to determine the internal force, we don't call that indeterminate. We are lucky. That would be an easy problem. But if the n number, which we call that degree of static indeterminacy, is larger than 1, the problem would be indeterminate and we need to take step number two through step number four to determine internal force. So what is N? Static, the degree of static indeterminacy is actually the difference between the number of equations and number of unknowns. Here you need to switch that. Number of unknowns minus number of equation gives me degree of indeterminacy. Step number two, write down all deflections as a function of internal force using this equation. Okay, that usually result in a in an equation like force divided by a number. Okay, the force is unknown. We are looking for that, and the other parameters are unknown. So that results in a force divided by something. Step number three: use the compatibility of deformations. Um, here we have three compatibility conditions or three compatible categories. In category number 1, which is for this case, delta 1 plus delta 2 is 0, or delta 1 plus delta 2 is gap. For all these shapes, we use uh, that compatibility condition. In category 2, like this, when one element is within the other element, or like this, or like this, we use delta 1 is equal to delta 2, or if we have a gap, Gap should be added to one side, depending which elongation is, which delta is shorter. And category number three is where we need to use similar triangles, like the figures that we see over here. All right? Once we establish the compatibility of deformations, we plug the deformations that we got in step number two into that equation, and that gives us one extra equation. And then we proceed to step number four and solve it for internal force. In the last step, we solve the equation that we get in a step number one and step number three and solve it to determine how much is internal force. Once we determine the internal force, the rest of the problem would be easy. And that would be maybe determining stress or determining the deformation or whatever. All right?